What's up, listeners and supporters of the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast? We need some help from you, and it won't take up too much of your time. As we grow, we always want to hear your feedback, so take a minute or two to fill out a short, anonymous survey. The survey link is right in the episode notes for this podcast. It's easy and takes less than five minutes. As always, we thank you for your continued support. Podcast episode 153, Dexter Henry, Brian Fonseca, you know, doing the thing, being responsible, socially distancing. Uh, the last time we had our guest that was here on the podcast and is with us today was right before the world changed. And uh, we had the COVID pandemic. And at the time, he was running for Congress. You see him right now. If you're watching this podcast, he is brushing what I call his quarantine beard. <laughs> And he told me he's here to stay. Uh, he's here. He's good. He's well. Our man, Sean. Sean, what's up, man? How you doing? What's up, guys? Yeah, when Brian hit me up, telling me you guys wanted me back, I was hyped because I had I had fun last time I was on your show. Like, probably, you know, I had a lot of good interviews during the campaign, but this is, when I did it with you guys, it's probably the most fun I've ever had. So man. I was, like, that's, I was hyped to come back. That's an honor. That's yeah, an man. Honor. That's, yeah. that's. And, and we. And you know, we wanted your thoughts before, you know, what's going to be the biggest election of all of our <laughs> lifetimes. So, yeah. like, yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. now I don't know. I don't know what's going to, I don't know where you were more anxious by comparison. Because <laughs> last time we had you before, you were running for uh, the congressional seat. Uh, yeah. And this time, while you're still doing the work, it's like now it's before the actual election where, I mean, look. It kind of is what it is at that point. So I mean, we'll we're, yeah. we'll, we'll get into it. Yeah, but no, Sean. But but you know, this is our guy Sean Chaudhry. Um, we had to have you, like Brian said, because we thought it'd be perfect for somebody that's really been in politics on a grassroots level um, to talk about politics again before such an important, obviously, election. As Brian said, maybe the most important of our lives um, right now. But before we hit into that, um, you're still out here doing the work. Um, you didn't get the win that you wanted in terms of getting that congressional seat for District 5, but you're still out here doing the work. You know, the work never stops, like basketball never stops. Um, you're still out here doing it. T- tell the people what you're still out here doing and, and how you're still representing. Yeah, I mean, you know, even after the election, I maybe took two days off, but I just had like this, the feeling I just wanted to go back out there and just keep on pushing, right? Because it's just, you know, success, success doesn't come overnight. And like, and so that with 2020 being such an anomaly for everyone, right? It's just such a weird year. Um, you know, we knew that it was going to be difficult, but we had to keep on pushing. Um, and obviously, just the beginning. So um, I'm still organizing within the community uh, right now um, for Veterans Day, actually, next week, um, doing a, a get together for a, with a lot of veterans from the community because a lot of them have stepped up during COVID uh, when a lot of families like couldn't afford groceries or even, if, you know, were afraid to even go out, step out to their homes just to pick up medicine. Uh, a lot of veterans that I know have stepped up to the plate and were helping out the community. So, um, you know, I'm throwing a, a thank you, get together for all the vets next week. Um, and you know, there's a lot of good people in, in Jamaica, Queens doing a lot of good stuff now. So uh, we're building, you know, building family, building unity. And, and I think that heading to 2021 after whatever happens, uh, on Tuesday, we want to build on more positivity, right? And just bring more love and a different kind of energy and vibe uh, into this world. So well, that's we, where we're at. Well, we absolutely need that positivity, energy, right. and love because i um, not saying that people have not been showing it this year, but when you look at the, the administration uh, that's there down in D.C. and in the White House, we haven't necessarily seen that. Now, we all know that everybody here on this podcast, we know we need to change. We talked about that on, 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 the, last, on the last podcast. I think something both Brian and I feel like known, and I know, Sean, you were also a Bernie supporter, but Bernie obviously not getting the nomination. Um, Joe Biden, Joe Biden now with it. How how are you feeling <laughs> heading into <laughs> heading into Tuesday, which is a day that I don't know, I think it's given a lot of people anxiety, man. I think a lot of people are like, look, man, we want to get this over. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of people I who don't just... work on Wednesday. That's a whole nother story. A lot of people want to get this over. How are you feeling heading into this? 
how honestly you want me to be because I'm sure Brian has seen me on social media just like well enough. Yo, be honest, be honest. <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's like, uh, and I'm not, I'm not saying I'm in the same or a different vote because I kind of don't know, but I know you've been critical of Joe Biden uh, in the previous tweets, and you know, rightfully, I see the side. Uh, rightfully so, you know what I mean? Do we really need a moderate at this point, or should we just push things the entire other way? That was the whole Bernie Biden thing. And of all the Democrats, I think at one point, Biden was probably my fourth or fifth favorite of them, which is not number one. But at the same yeah. time, I still think it's a big improvement for what we're seeing now. However, um, we kind of need something more than that. But I guess, where do you stand in terms of Joe Biden now, uh, you know, heading into Tuesday? You know, <laughs> the last couple of weeks, I kind of just like accepted it for what it is at this point. Um, just because like current politics is so emotionally, spiritually, physically draining. Oh, and you know, I want to, the thing is like, I want to like Joe Biden. Like I want to, right? Yeah. But he just says something every now and then, or even Kamala says something every now and then. I'm like, oh, I'm just like shaking my head. Like, for example, uh, the, the vice presidential debate between Kamala and Mike Pence, yeah. right? Uh, Mike Pence was coming at Kamala Harris and Joe Biden for supporting the Green New Deal, you know, bringing our country into a renewable energy kind of economy. And just hearing Kamala saying, you know, that they will not ban fracking, that they support fracking, it's like, yeah, you know, who, who, like, who, who is your base? Like, are you trying to really cater to the more, you know, Republican base? Or are you trying to really net the party? And, you know, for me, I really question the integrity and the moral compass of the party. And I feel like we shouldn't be afraid of doing that. Uh, but at the same time, it's like, I want to vote for, I want to vote for them. And I, I will on the uh, Working Families Party's line. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, Trump is the biggest threat on not just this country, but this planet <laughs> yeah. you know, at this point. So. Yeah. Um, you know, my, my biggest concern though, is that, you know, we, we have these conversations about, you know, we could push, we could push Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, you know, to the left after the election. But I have deep concerns about that happening because if, if we do get to that point, they're going to be talking about, you know, Hey, we just got the seat. We need to keep the Senate. We need to keep the house. So we shouldn't be having in, in house fighting. So it's, it's not going to end. And, you know, I really do expect a lot of people and I hope that a lot of folks who are now voting, we're seeing high turnout of early voting throughout the country, which is fantastic. Um, I hope that a lot of people who are now voting for the first time um, will continue to be active and engage with, with electoral politics because we can't slip up, right? We can't be complacent because the moment we take our foot off the, the pedal, you know, we're going to have the, the same the same issues, the government taking advantage of everyday working people. So we can't let that happen. You talked about the party being divided, Sean, and I've been wondering this for quite some time. You know, th there seems to be this sort of otherization of people who maybe were in the, the Bernie camp or people like AOC, I know, who's a, a, a mentor to you, people who they get labeled as democratic socialist, um, which I probably will say that I am one. Um, but there seems to be a division between that, although I look at it as a positive that I think more younger people are trending toward those ideas and actually thinking about what's better for society as a whole. Do you think, and it, it obviously clearly not going to happen in this election, right? As you kind of laid out, but do you think going forward, the party uh, in terms of the Democratic Party can be divided or can any party be divided? Because, you know, Republicans on that side, it's not like they're all in agreement with everything. Can any party truly ever be fully united? Uh, I don't think so. And that's why we need to be a country where we can have multiple parties, right? Uh, because right now we are in a two-party system where both only the Democratic Party and Republican Party are have the strongest voices in our democracy. And I feel like the majority of people are more independent thinkers, um, but we know that a lot of independent voters cannot vote in the primary, so that's why you see a lot of independent voters being left out. Um, and then when it comes to general, it's like, well, you know, neither party really speaks to the values. Um, and in which there's a lot of resentment that builds up because of that. Um, even with Bernie Sanders being left out, we, we see that there's a, a division. Uh, some folks have decided to vote for Joe Biden. Other are, you know, leaning towards uh, voting for the Green Party or voting for other parties just because, um, you know, what we have right now doesn't speak to the values. So I definitely do think there's a future um, 
for, for voters to really believe in a party that speaks to the values and that party can have a platform in a democracy. I don't know how long that will be, how long it will take, but I do think that uh, November 3rd will be the turning point for that. So I'm, yeah. I'm curious to see um, where that goes, but it's going to really take a lot of work from a lot of grassroots organizers, um, you know, to really bring in new people and show what is possible. I'm not sure there's an answer to this, but in regards to, because you brought up the two-party system, and obviously there's more, there are a lot more people saying, like, yo, we need more options. We need to sort of move away from that thinking. We should have three, four, or maybe make the Green Party or independent parties, like, actually viable options where they get to speak at some of these debates because we don't even know who they are. Like, is there a movement that can be, I guess, you know, that we can see sort of go into that? Like, is there something that we can see where that actually becomes a thing uh, maybe in the near future or in the future at all? I think it's possible. You know, I think that looking at uh, DSA, you know, Democratic Socialist America, for example, you know, they've, uh, DSA ha in its own right have started like their own avenue, created its own lane of running candidates uh, that only speak to the values, right? Like even on a local level, they will only endorse candidates that are not afraid to be labeled as socialist or are, you know, are willingly enough to support things like Medicare for all, you know, housing justice, racial justice. Um, and I think that when we build that kind of power, that people power, yeah. uh, people will, candidates especially, no matter what level of office, will really, I'm hoping, will we'll see that. Um, we'll see the true power of people just coming together and, um, and you know, that's how AOC won, right? Like we, for example, you know, uh, DSA had a strong base, have, or they have a strong presence in their district. And because of the amount of people power that they had, uh, the amount of, uh, you know, ground grain that they had, um, people are starting to see that, wow, this, this is serious, right? Like they should start listening more, start seeing like, all right, the, the issues that DSA and people, even everyday people who are part of DSA, by the way, right? These are people who are like your waiters, your waitresses, who work in retail, regular right. people. Uh, but they're all coming together for a common cause. Right. And now we're seeing candidates uh, running for office understanding that. And I think that's a, that's a really good thing. So I think the, the avenue there is uh, it's, it's definitely viable down the future. Do you think that you, you mentioned about, and I talked a little about this too, but it's about the, the sort of stigma around the term socialist and now even to democratic socialist, right? And to some degree, we can say not to make this any candidates that come forward that kind of identify as that. It's still kind of a, oh, uh, I don't know about that. Why? I, I've been trying to figure this especially out, too. Especially from older folks, too. Yeah, especially from older folks, right? And maybe maybe some of that is age. And yeah. why is there such negativity towards that word? I always look at it, Sean, as possibly people do not understand truly what socialism is fundamentally and also democratic socialism more specifically is. Right. Do you, why is there such an aversion and, and, and what needs to be done to get the country to understand more what it's really about. Yeah, and I think that there's a gap between the older generation, you know, Gen X and boomers understanding of, you know, they lived through a different time period, right? Where uh, they, you know, through the Cold War maybe, and, mm -hmm. you know, they'll, they'll always bring up Cuba and Venezuela, but they're so ignorant to the fact of how much US uh, played a huge role in, you know, US interventionism. Um, blockading trades, right? And they're like, we, our country, are the ones actually screwed up the economy. So, because of where the state that Venezuela, Central America, the kind of state that they're in, um, it, we're, we played a big factor into that. So, when we have people who are labeling socialism or communism as a bad thing, um, they're only telling one side of the story. Yep. You know? For you know? So, right. You know, like, yeah, sure. Were there authoritarians? Sure, you know, absolutely there are things that happen, but we're talking about the quality of life that improved for so many people, healthcare, education, you name it, you know, uh, and, and it happened under socialism policies. Um, but again, it's the older people that are really labeling it as such a bad thing because, you know, of you know, quote unquote dictators, but we don't want to question our own dictator that we have here who's a fascist authoritarian right like that we are living in a fascist state right now um especially what's going on with the whole black Lives matter movement like, oh, george floyd ahmaud aubrey breonna taylor with all these protests going on we have the government state and federal government 
throwing out the po- police in the streets and militarized gear, gassing, tear gassing people, shooting people, brutalizing people. And that's the definition of a fascist state. So we are no different from the, any of the dictators that, you know, they claim that we align ourselves with. Um, that's why I'm not leaving now. my house November 2nd. I'm staying home. Yeah. I'm not dealing with with any of that shit. I already voted early. (laughs) I was like, I'm already not leaving the house. Uh, I was going to, I was going to bring this up to both of you because like, you know, we're start, we're seeing the numbers, we're seeing all the projections and things like that. And I'm trying to remember how does this compare to 2016? Because like, you're seeing a lot of information suggesting that this is different in terms of like Biden has more of a lead. I kind of don't really think it matters until it's actually said and done because of what we learned four years ago. But, like, does this feel any different to you guys other than the fact that we're seeing a lot, like, record numbers of voter turnout? Well, Sean, you, Sean, I'm going to say this before I let you go. You let me remember. I remember, if I'm correctly, like, Hillary had a, like, what was it, nine percentage point poll lead uh, at this time, like, a couple days before the, the election or whatever last year. And so we've seen that that doesn't matter. I've, my attitude towards that, and what I'll say, Brian, before I let Sean, who's more, has more expertise in this, I, from the last election and even, when Obama won in 2008, I we have seen poll projections turn to not mean much. We've seen it switch. And, you know, what you should learn from the last election is there was a sort of silent group of people that probably didn't want to associate themselves as supporters of the guy in office. And they clearly yeah. went out, voted for them, and also particularly white women, which had a huge swing um, in, in, in the race there and were responsible for him being where he is. That's a whole nother story. But yeah, I, I, I just, what I'll say is, I don't necessarily trust the polls, man. I'm just kind of yeah. <laughs> going to wait and see. I don't know. How do you feel about that, Sean? No, no. I agree with you 100%. Dex. Like, I don't trust the polls. And so let's see, when the numbers come in, they'll come in then, you know, it is what it is. But I do not trust the polls. Anything could happen. Um, actually, right before I got on, I was looking at a poll out in, what's it? Michigan. Uh, yeah. Michigan is a swing state. Yeah. And right now, Trump, it's a 2% margin, uh, margin error, but... Trump has a 2% lead over Joe Biden, uh, but it's really the, the key swing states that come into play, right? Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Florida. These states are going to play a critical role in determining who's going to win. Um, and I think that's what it's going to come down to, you know? Um, we're lucky enough to live in New York. Uh, it's oh, a, yeah. You know, we're, it's a true I say blue, that uh, shit all the time. <laughs> yeah, especially in New York City, right? Like, yeah. uh, because of how dense our population is, um, you know, fortunately, I think that our, we're about over 80% of Democrats live in New York City. So yeah. we're fortunate, right? Um, but it's really the peace when states that are going to deter, that's going to be the difference maker here. Um, so we got to, we have to really rely on those folks out there to, uh, you know, choose what's best for not just them, but for the rest of the country. Yeah. Yeah. And I honestly think they'll get it done. I think, we're, I think we'll get it done, but at the same time, I'm just not ignoring it perhaps like a lot of people flippantly were in 2016 like the voter Mm -hmm. turnout is one thing that's encouraged me at least and now like a lot of stuff has happened you know you would think in the last four years that would you know awake awaken people i guess you would say but you know we'll see no brian brings that up and that's kind of perfect segue into something i wanted to ask sean which is like with stuff the stuff that's happened in the last four years but you specifically talked about a lot of stuff that we saw this past summer um, you know, with the Black Lives Matter movement, with the deaths of, of unarmed black people um, being killed at the hands of police and seeing so much outrage where I do think the pandemic had something to do with that and getting people out into the streets. But with that, and you, you could kind of be inspired and say, hey, I think a change is really coming here. But at the same time, you could be like Brian, where Brian's, what Brian's kind of saying is I'm op- optimistically cautious uh, a- a- as well, too. Let's look at the worst case scenario here, which we all know oh. what that is. But let's look at the worst case scenario here. And November 4th, we wake up or whenever it takes for all the votes to be counted and tallied. And we got another four years with this guy that doesn't seem to care about people who look like any of us. Where do we go from there, man? Because I feel like that, I feel like that's a real question. Yeah, I, I had to ask Sean. You know, Toronto, we had to ask the question. We got that's to. where we go. We go to Toronto. That's where we go. <laughs> so here, here's, here's, here's my ideal vision right if if shit hits the fan i think that um i think this would be a silver lining to this right yes it's gonna be I agree. terrible i agree it's gonna be terrible we're gonna be stuck for uh, for another four years with this guy but i think that 
it's going to really start to make a lot of people question um, the system even more, right? Because people, we're seeing a lot more people engaged. But now, if let's say Trump does win, they're going to be like, what went wrong? You know, and they're going to maybe question what's wrong with the Democratic Party. Um, and I think in that essence, right, um, in some ways, it's, uh, you know, we're being martyred, I guess. But I think that we're going to see a lot more people start being more radicalized. Um, and I think in that essence, it would be good for a lot more leftists, a lot more, you know, socialists um, in the future, because especially for like you know, Bernie Sanders, I don't think he's going to be running again. But I think that heading down to 2024, 2028, we could possibly see a candidate, uh, a, pro- a progressive left socialist candidate, uh, yeah, you know, who, who knows? It could happen, right? It, it can definitely happen. But I think it's going to really start radicalizing a lot more people. And a lot of the younger people like us, you know, we're getting to that age now. We're in thirties and forties. We're going to become the the majority of the the block of voters heading heading to the future. And, and before you jump in, Dex, I want yeah. to say that I think I think that's going to happen regardless at some point because I feel like it almost has to, given our sensibilities compared to people that are older than us. But I do think that if this dude wins again, it'll be accelerated in that way. I do agree with that. I guess I guess the, the, the kind of, not a pushback to you, Sean, but the question I would have, right, is you said that if this happened, it could be have the silver lining and people become more radicalized. And I could totally see that. But I do yep. think it would be fair to question, yo, why didn't this happen after the last election? <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Like, Even what? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they probably had, but you know what? I think I think to to sort of jump in real quick. I think maybe after seeing these four years, probably like you know flips the switch for some people because after it happens, a lot of people are still like, oh, it doesn't matter who the president is. You still got to do what you got to do. Uh, you know, I don't care. President can't tell me shit. There was a lot of that going around. Like, oh, you know, how bad is it really going to be? It's not going to really dictate our lives. And then we see in twenty twenty of all years, the last year of his term hopefully the last year forever of his term, that, like, yo, COVID affects everybody in the world, and this is something that he had the in on early, could have, you know, nipped in the butt uh, to some degree, and, you know, we are where we are now, where we're still having record cases uh, almost a pregnancy later. Some are always looking for more sports content, and among the glut of sports media, some are looking for sports content that dives a bit deeper and doesn't just stick to sports. So check out Backpack Broadcasting's original long-form sports journalism series, Sideline Stories. The award-winning original series takes viewers directly into underrepresented communities within the world of sports. It's a series that goes beyond traditional sports reporting, like box scores and statistics, presenting exclusive stories that you won't find anywhere else. With a diverse group of correspondents, the series provides interviews and interesting stories around the world of sports, because there is so much beyond the game, and so much that occurs off the field or court that impacts each of us and the world we live in. Giving a voice to athletes, coaches, fans, and everyone involved in athletics, Sideline Stories looks to push sports storytelling further than ever before. It's a winner of the 2020 Independent Shorts Awards, and all episodes of Sideline Stories are available for viewing today on Backpack Broadcasting's YouTube channel and Facebook page. Can we talk about that for a second? Can we talk about COVID and the way this administration has responded to it and what we continue to see through this election cycle? Sean, this guy is out there having major rallies. People ain't wearing masks. Getting COVID. (laughs) <laughs> They're getting COVID. They're laughing at people, criticizing even Biden for wearing a mask, which is which is just whack, right? Like none of that is cool. And this is okay. When you look at, forget everything else that's happened in the last four years, the racism, the xenophobia, the sexism we've seen for this guy, which is right. awful. When you look at that, where it's not caring about public health and safety um, and so reckless with it, what? how does that make, as a politician, how does that make you feel? You know, I think when we look at public safety in terms of COVID, it's in the center of, of everything, right? It's interconnected to uh, having our small businesses up and running, ensuring that our schools are safe. Because if we're not ensuring uh, public safety, keeping everyone safe, then it's going to affect everything else. Because it's, you know, what, what the problem is right now with this administration is that they're looking at the short-term goals, short-term gains for, for the corporate donors. We've seen how billionaires have uh, continued to capitalize off of this pandemic. I think to date they have made um, over six hundred billion dollars total. Um, Jeff Bezos, still you know the richest guy in the world, has made billions of dollars during this pandemic. While we had working families losing everything—their homes, their jobs, 
you know, their loved ones. And these are things that we can't get back and it's going to be, it's going to take years to recover from. Um, so I think that with this government right now, they're looking at short term gains for the, for the short term goals. Um, but it does it really does affect everyday people like us who's, you know, where we lost, again, we lost everything. So, um, I, I think that, you know, I wish, I, I'm sure a lot of us had wished that, uh, this government was more competent, competent enough to understand how severe this was because they knew the thing was, they knew ahead of time yeah. that COVID was coming. They, they knew for a couple months, uh, but they chose to ignore it and it was too little too late, right? The damage is already done. So, um, yeah, we could have really saved, we probably could have been in a better situation right now if we had gone into a complete, you know, shutdown, had kept people safe. Uh, but here we are, you know, we're still in this, in this mess, uh, countries like New Zealand, for example, they like they, over there, they, you know, they handled it completely like fantastically well, yeah. uh, to the point where they had zero cases and they're living, they're fine now, you know, and it's for some reason, you know, the U S we're at the butt of everyone's jokes throughout the world. Um, so yeah, but, but, and the rest of the U S they want us to get this election right too. I mean, majority of them, they're like yo because you're gonna if you're gonna vote for this dude again it's gonna fuck it up for all of us because of international relations and all this shit that we got to deal with too uh one thing i wanted to bring up to both you guys uh because we do talk hip-hop on this podcast. i know i knew you were going here i knew you were <laughs> going here sure, and, I, and, I, and i'm ha- and i'm happy yeah colin kaepernick shirt um hopefully he votes this time also because we could use that but uh what's it called yes uh lil wayne uh, uh 50 you know what i mean i've been seeing it on my timeline all day so 50 Cent has apparently stood down. I forgot who was it that made him like do that. And apparently there's a story around. I forgot who the woman was, but she made him stand down and vote for Biden or some shit. I got to read it again. But I saw that going around in the news and 50 Cent, because he's a troll, uh, posted on Instagram last night the photo of Lil Wayne and Donald Trump. He's like, oh, no, Wayne, I would never do this shit. <laughs> so I found that kind of funny, even though it's also reckless. Oh, uh, but. Lil Wayne and just other art. The dude who made Nuck If You Buck, he's yeah. another one um, that produced the beat, which is weird. Uh, who's the, was it Tank? I think was the R&B singer. Tank. Yeah, um, there's like, so there's a bunch of artists in entertainment. Lil Pump, who we don't care about. He's actually a Colombian, so that's, you know, one of the Latinos. That's one of our people, but he's not one of my people because he's from Florida. Florida Hispanics are like a little bit different um <laughs> generally but especially cubans but like just what are we thinking hearing this and like and oh kanye and the obvious one yeah. just what are we think and ice cube what are we thinking seeing these things in entertainment and just from you know people that you know guys grow up loving or whatever the case may be but then i don't know there's just there's a thing that's specific to artists like rappers for example and how they're wired where i see these things from certain people that it, it doesn't surprise me. It would surprise me if it was like a Nas or a J. Cole, but we know that's not going to happen. But right. in terms of these other dudes, it doesn't surprise me as much. But how did you guys react to this? You know, you want to go first, Dex? Um, so I'll, there's this interesting thing, right, around hip hop. And, and Sean, you've probably seen this too, and, and Brian too. You know, a lot of these guys in hip hop have rapped, previous to Trump being the president, rapped about kind of, idolizing Trump or Trump money. There's so many bars where somebody says something about Trump money or wanting that, right? And so yeah. I think there's this, there's always been this idolization in hip hop that should actually be discussed here and called out, right? Like this this love of money, but I think it's fair to question at what cost, right? Like it's fine to like money and have things. I'm not saying that, but at what cost, you know? And what's interesting to me is, and I, I'm going to speak specifically on this because I'm black. A lot of people in hip hop are black. And they're young black men who come from the hood, which I did as well. And it's fine. I understand the desire to want money and get out. But when you know what's been done in your communities, when you know how they've been affected by people like Sean talks about, uh, the billionaire class that doesn't care about the working families. This is across all races, white, black, Latino, um, South Asian, whatever you may be. Across has not shown to care about those people, especially the poor and working class folks. And then you just sort of idolize, want to get them and forget that those people are still being stepped on and tossed to the side and all this stuff, again, which Trump has kind of put out there as his mantra to do. 
I don't understand. Like, personally, I don't understand how you could support that dude considering where you're from. There are people like Sean, <laughs> to bring it up, who are, are literally doing the work in the community of where he is from and beyond, you know, and understands the responsibility that you can't turn your back on them. So when I see that, that's disappointing to me. That's kind of what I'll say. But to Brian's point, I'm not surprised either from some of these dudes because they've kind of talked and promoted this this sort of lifestyle. So you kind of have to be like, ah, whatever. Like when 50 did it, I was like, yo, you have an album called Get Rich or Die Trying. You might not necessarily care about what it takes to necessarily get that money. So when you say you want the lower taxes, I kind of get it, right? Like you've seen, you've like kind of made it be about this. So I can't really be shocked um, at this point. Cube wasn't as shocking because he's put his politics out there for a long time about it, kind of how it's been. I just he posted think a video, he posted a video, not to cut you off, but he posted a video like shortly before that broke where it was just him talking about politics or whatever. And it was just seven minutes of bullshit. Yeah. Just and no, it just said nothing. He doesn't. The, my problem with it, and this is why I let Sean get in. My problem with it is like, yo, we, Brian and I do a podcast. We talk sports, hip hop. We'll talk politics. But I'll tell you, I'm not bringing on to talk about it. No disrespect. 50 Cent, Lil Wayne, Ice Cube, not to talk about that. I'm going to bring Sean on to talk about it because he's done the work. Let's let the people who've actually done work for the people, they should be the ones speaking and talking about the platforms. I don't really care to hear from Ice Cube on that. I don't need to hear from Ice Cube on that at all. because And that's no disrespect to Ice Cube. If Ice Cube wants to do something or a rapper wants to do something, well, hey, amplify Sean. Go amplify AOC. Go amplify those grassroots organizations that are actually doing the work for folks who look like us. And look, stop endorsing people who don't give a damn about you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think you hit it. Sorry. Hit it right <laughs> no, 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 no. You were, you were pretty spot on on all that. You know, I think that, for one, I wasn't surprised either. You know, I think that when you're, when you come out of the hood for so long and you're, you're part of this, this 1% class, you know, mm. you, you're going to want to protect your your riches right and i think that for people like ice cube and it's like listen they've been out the hood for a, a minute now so all they care about is their money so i see where they're coming from i disagree with them but i see where they're coming from but you know that's what it's come down to is that they care more about protecting the wealth and you know the class status uh but not really thinking about how it's affecting you know the people that you know from the community that they've come from you know uh, in the long run they're not thinking yep. about that uh because they're not in these neighborhoods anymore so um it was it's yes yeah, disappointing but it was unsurprising at the same time um yeah it, it is what it is yeah you gotta have that side for this you, you kind of yeah. got to can can you set the stakes for us sean can you say for people we kind of talked about this at the top but how important is november 3rd man <laughs> like how important is it that we get this right <laughs> you know in my lifetime uh, I'm sure in our lifetime, actually, for all of us, this is probably the most critical election we have ever Easily. seen. Easily. 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 Yeah. I can't, you know, I remember, you know, 2008 being bad, you know, leading up to Obama. Like, I remember that was a good time, right? You know, electing President uh, Barack Obama. That was an important one. But, um, man, who would have ever thought, right, even to this day, four years later, who would have thought Donald Trump would be president? And this is the outcome of it, right? Like. Uh, we kind of knew what he would be, you know, the idea of Trump, what he would bring um, in 2016, but now seeing the catastrophe, the, you know, of it and what he left behind is like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's like, wow. Yeah. That's. I, I didn't like, I, honestly, like as bad as we all probably could have foreseen, I don't know if anyone pictured it being like this. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know if anyone, although there have been a couple of freaky things that will be online, like, oh, somebody predicted a pandemic that he wouldn't be able to control or somebody predict. Like, I've seen some of those things. So maybe there are some people. But like for me, for example, as just, I guess, a casual observer of this to some degree, I didn't think it was going to be like, like negative 10 out of 10. You know what I mean? Like all the way down, which is crazy. But I mean, yeah, I, I think this is far and wide the most critical election of our lifetimes. Uh, yeah. you know, uh, second would probably be 2016, I guess, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, you, you you would have to say that. Do you have any hope, Sean? You know, I know I know you were not full supporters of the uh, the Biden Harris ticket, but you're rocking with your party, which you know I think the knowledgeable, level headed ones of us are are still doing. 
um because we can't rock the other way and, and let me and let me yeah. say this let me say this because like yo you know my parent theory like my whole thing with and i told dexter about this the parent theory is that look when it comes to the certain politicians or whatever the case may be, like, I know I'm not going to be able to agree with them 100 percent. And I've sort of resigned myself to that, which is how I could get behind certain people, because I argue with my mom 50 percent of the time we talk. So it's like, <laughs> look, I can I can put in a vote for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris if I agree with 64.7 percent of their ideologies or whatever the case may be. I can right. live with. It, right. So I just I'm just saying, like, yo, I don't think people you know, need to be behind somebody 100% of the time because that's just not going to be the case. Like, if me and Dexter have 10 conversations, we got to disagree at some point. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. That just is what it is. Right. Now, the stakes, right. admittedly, the stakes are higher with this. You know what I mean? But, like, right. it's just sort of, I think people should look at it in a different sort of way sometimes. Yeah, nobody's going to be 100% behind a candidate, Sean, and, and we can agree, even agree with people on the other side of yeah. stuff where I probably draw the line are things that affect humanity. That's that's kind of like where I yeah. my line in the sand is drawn. If you're going to vote for somebody where he doesn't care about other people, or he's going to be racism, sexism, xenophobia, um, yeah. all this kind of hate. Not if you shoot, if you go to, if you go visit San Juan and shoot paper towels after Hurricane Maria, I'm out. Right, like the, I'm yeah, out. like, like God, we, we, you know, yeah. like, we, we can't, we can't, we can't do that. Like there has at some point, a man's got to have a code, a woman's got to have a code, and you got to say no. But are you at least encouraged, especially with the state of the country, that a Biden-Harris ticket, uh, if they win, hopefully, can turn things around um, going, going forward? Are you at least somewhat encouraged about that? Uh, no. <laughs> That's no. fair. I'm, now, I'm I, I, I will cut you right there, Sean. Is yeah, that no. more of you're not encouraged in them? Or you're not encouraged because of the system that is currently in place. Both, both. It has to be both because you know they they're they're playing it for the party, right? They 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 will they're all about the party, you know. At the end of the day, um, and you know, really playing, making sure that Democratic Party, the establishment. I'm talking about the establishment wing of the party um, are the ones in power, um, and yeah. that does play systemically, right, in terms of corporate donors, in terms of pushing legislation that is going to not help everyday working people. So I question it, right? Like I, I that's just my biggest fear is that that's not going to change systemically because yes, we could get Trump out of office, but we still need to get to the root of white supremacy and nationalism. We need to get to the root of why there's money in politics. Why doesn't everyone have health care? Like that's another thing, for example, uh, that a question uh, Biden Harris on is like we need to have Medicare for all. Like it's so popular with everyday people, but we need to. It's not enough to have uh, you know insurance interest still in in our healthcare system. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. So I, so I'm going to continue questioning that. Um, but I have zero faith um, with them to be honest. Uh, but I think that where I do have hope is really on the ground, uh, local politics. Um, you know we see it does it doesn't necessarily get the kind of recognition that national politics does but here in queens in in brooklyn too throughout the boroughs there's a lot of grassroots candidates that won their elections in the primaries and are not gonna go into you know whether it's albany or city council next year that's coming coming along um we're seeing a lot of candidates who are really good people too who are just from the community doing the work and have these values that are empowered by making sure that you know that we're all good um, so I'm more encouraged and have more faith in that right now. Uh, so I'm sticking with that in the meantime. But I think that I'm just waiting to see what happens after November 3rd. I think that if we do build a strong coalition to hopefully push one to two things on, on Biden's table, then I'll have some hope then. But right now I have zero confidence in them. Uh, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you brought up the grassroots stuff. Any, any last message or words you want to tell people uh, about November third. I mean, I think it's kind of pretty obvious to tell people to get out and vote. But any any last message or words you want to leave with people? Yeah. To, to be clear, um, vote for Biden Harris, though. Like, not just. I, I'm tired of people just saying vote. I'm like, nah. We gotta we gotta make sure you're voting for the right motherfuckers. Yeah. You know what I'm I saying? feel you. I, I'm not gonna hold you. I don't, I don't like to vote shame people. You know, I think at the end of the day, people it's it's the right to vote who they want to vote for, but they need to be educated on who they're voting for. Uh, but you know, I again, I'm supporting Biden and Harris on the working families party line, I think that for, and you know, this is a message to all of the voters who may be, still may be undecided or who are independent voters or whatever it may be, but 
um, it's critical to keep the working families party line uh, because that's the party line that you know really speaks to the values of working people um, and unions and labor. So I think that if you don't want to vote for the Democratic Party ticket, that's fine. You can still vote for Biden and Harris on the WFP line because we need that um, every election cycle to really um, utilize that for working people. So, um, and it's early voting still, right? So if you had the chance, go out there, it's still vote now. You don't have to wait until election day. Um, but you know, we have a couple, a few days left. So, uh, let's see what happens. All right. Well, it's going to be interesting. And, and, and in New York city, we didn't bring this up, but it, I mean, we kind of touched on it, but in New York city, we have a mayor's race, like right around the corner. So <laughs> yeah. So the mayor, the mayor race city council, that's going to be huge. Uh, I think there's over 30 something city council seats open up, um, for next year, um, yeah. plus the mayor election. So that's going to be literally after this election and that's going to be, that's going right into it. Um, so it's going to be great. It's going to be pretty crazy. And Sean, you talked about it. People got to get more active in, in local politics, supporting grassroots organizations. That's the things we need to see going forward. Not just, uh, getting excited every four years with the pre presidential, <laughs> um, election. No, we, we, we can't do that. Sean, yeah. man, it was so good to talk to you. We needed this. Later, we needed this before, uh, the election. Uh, hopefully, Going forward, we can give people some, some some more hope. Going forward, we hope we hope for that. Hopefully Absolutely. that hope, hopefully we can. Thanks, Sean. We appreciate you coming on with us. Appreciate you, man. Hi, guys. Take care.